Good afternoon, everyone. We are going to start our uh, session on hypertension, and our respected chairperson is Sujoy Pal. Uh, handing over the session to our respected chairperson. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and. Uh, We'll be starting the session on portal hypertension, which uh, is supposed to be, or was supposed to be, one of the uh, uh, the most exciting parts of uh, HPB and GI surgery at one point of time. Con still continues to be. Of course, uh, there have been many uh, other competing treatments which have tried to decrease the importance of surgery, but uh, not notwithstanding that, as a surgical conference, we'll still continue to promote surgery for extrahepatic portal venous obstruction. And uh, today, to talk on the surgical aspects, we have uh, Dr. Sandeep Jain, who will be talking about uh, indications and types of shunt surgery in EHPVO, and what is the justification. Dr. Sandeep, please. The talk is for 15 minutes. We are uh, starting early, so we can have uh, four to five minutes of discussion thereafter. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Thank you, organizers, for giving me this opportunity. So as the topic indicates, it's about the indications and types of shunt surgery in EHPVO and what are the justifications. EHPVO with or without bleeding is associated with three to 10% mortality. And the aim of shunt surgery in this indication is to divert portal blood flow into systemic circulation. Various indications include persistent bleeding after medical and endoscopic treatment, ectopic varices and large fundal variceal bleed, which is not amenable to medical and endoscopic treatment, portal biliopathy, so as to decompress portal system prior to HJ in few patients, massive splenomegaly with or without infarction, symptomatic hypersplenism, and growth retardation. What are the types of bypass shunt surgeries for EHPVO? <coughs> splenorenal shunts, essentially of two types, proximal splenorenal shunt, where splenectomy is also done, and side-to-side -side splenorenal shunt, mesenterico left portal vein shunt, which is also known as Rex shunt, and there are few mention of unconventional shunts in EHPVO in peculiar conditions, which includes IMV renal or cable shunt, splenoadrenal, collaterorenal shunts. Regarding splenorenal shunts, PSRS with splenectomy, as per AIMS Delhi study, overall mortality was shown to be 1.9%, which was even less in elective shunts, and with a rebleed rate of 11%, and actuarial survival at 15 years, 95%, without any incidence of post-operative hepatic, hepatic encephalopathy. PGI Chandigarh study on side-to-side -side splenorenal shunt also shows the, showed the similar uh, excellent results. Shunt patency rate of 87%, rebleed of 10%, and no HE after mean follow-up 54 months. Western series also showed the similar results with patency rates of 90 to 95%, rebleed rates of 5 to 10%, no HE, and actuarial survival rate after 15 years of 95%. Advantages of splenorenal shunt includes consistently effective for bleeding esophagogastric varices, ameliorates ectopic varices and PHG, treats portal biliopathy, reverses growth retardation, with overall improvement in scholastic abilities, physical activities, social interaction in majority of patients. So essentially, all the ill effects of EHPVO, both the primary complication, prom, primary uh, manifestation of bleed and all the complications are taken care of by these shunts. Now coming to Rex shunt, it involves a graft placement between SMV and left portal vein, and its theoretical advantage when it started, it was gaining popularity was that it is more physiological as most of the portal blood is going back to the liver. But over the few last few years, many studies have shown that there are significant disadvantages of this shunt. They include higher rate of shunt thrombosis in comparison to portosystemic shunts, 14 versus 6%. MRS most often required invasive procedure to correct this post-operative stenosis and thrombosis. On the other hand, portosystemic shunts offer less risk of serious postoperative complications when compared to Rex shunt. 
US study on Rex Chen showed thrombosis rate of 14% and all of them required surgical revision. 66% of that had re-thrombosis and all of them underwent surgical revision to portosystemic shunting. Asian study from China on Rex Chen showed 13 re-operations which were required after Rex thrombosis, shunt thrombosis and stenosis. Secondary patency rate Patency was achieved in five out of five of conversions to portosystemic shunts. And in four out of eight revisions, that remained MRS, that is Rex shunt. Now we have multiple studies which had either all or majority of their thrombosed Rex shunts converted to po successfully to portosystemic shunts. A salvage approach from initial portosystemic shunt to Rex is not advisable because the post-operative thrombosis rate is even higher than the original when you do Rex shunt for the first time. It's almost double. Portosystemic shunt in comparison to Rex rarely required re-operation or interventional radiology procedure despite having high stenosis rates. The hypothesis is that there is some luminal patency making it amenable to endovascular treatment and medical therapy with anticoagulation and antiplatelet medications. Theoretical advantages of Rex shunt like, improve, like improvements in liver size, synthetic function, did not translate in terms of clinical outcomes as physical growth and mental development. In studies on portosystemic shunts versus Rex shunt in children, no significant differences were found in their growth improvements in terms of height and weight parameters and on mental development. There is no evidence of encephalopathy after portosystemic shunts as well after long-term follow-up. Rex shunt is not a viable option in more than 55% of EHPVO patients due to unfavorable anatomy, which may be because of endothelial injury or fibrosis of the left portal vein as a result of umbilical vein catheterization. Portosystemic shunts were associated with a lower thrombosis rates than MRS and required fewer interventions, as I told earlier. So as per the evidence, portosystemic shunts offer advantage to pediatric population with EHPVO in comparison to Rex shunt. Coming, a small mention about unconventional shunts, which includes IMV renal or cable shunt, splenoadrenal and collaterorenal. They are rarely used. The reasons of their usage includes non-availability of SMV and SV due to extensive thrombosis. In this particular situation, IMV renal or cable shunt is a good uh, method. Anatomical abnormalities making PSR is difficult or impossible due to left renal agenesis, retroaortic left renal vein. But now we have evidence that PSRS can be possible in this particular type of anatomical variation. Non-availability of free LRV segment for sufficient length and friable plaque filled splenic vein. So I conclude saying that surgical shunt is an only solution for the treatment of EHPVO with complications and or failed endoscopic therapy. Portosystemic shunts in the form of splenorenal shunts is the most versatile, effective, and with least post-procedure complications to tackle all the manifestations of each EHPVO in both pediatric and adult patients. Thank you. Thank you, Sandeep, for being uh, precise and concise in your conclusions. Uh, uh, to my mind, uh, it's important that you highlighted that uh, uh, the Mesorex shunt, which has been uh, really touted as one of the good options for treating EHO in most of the Western series, which initially actually started in the patients who had undergone pediatric LDLTs, where uh, the liver was, uh, the portal vein had thrombosed in them in the post-operative phase, and then the surgeon decided to, you know, bypass that thrombus portal vein from there, there on, it was transposed into EHO management, routine EHO management. But apart from the few series that I've seen from Europe and the surgical series that you quoted from China, I don't think there is any head-to-head -head comparison between uh, long-term results. And you rightly pointed about the long-term complications. If anybody has any personal experience from the floor, as far as major extent is concerned, I would be happy if they share it now. Mike, please. So we have done one, sir. Uh, one as a mesorex and in another 
we had uh, basically used the middle colic vein itself to anastomose to the rex vein. Both these patients, very early on, we don't have a long-term experience with these. And uh, they were both in the pediatric age group. One was a four-year-old child with uh, certain other congenital anomalies, more like weight was around 10 kgs. And the other one was also a four-year-old uh, child. So, so why did you choose it? Just uh, for the sake of trying it or? No, it's because, uh, so in... You wanted to preserve the spleen. Yeah, in the preserve the spleen, in uh, one of the child, the problem was of an ectopic varix. He had a very interesting uh, varix in the ileum. And uh, he, the splenic vein, the size was uh, just 2 mm. So we didn't have much of an option to use that. So we tried it in case it would work. And in another, we just wanted to preserve the spleen for the child because he didn't, uh, there was no splenomegaly or hypersplenism per se. And he was having refractory portal hypertension requiring multiple endoscopies. So for that particular reason. Okay. Anybody else has any experience to Can share? I make a comment? Yes. So we would prefer to go ahead with devascularization in our practice. Uh, we don't do any makeshift shunt. We don't do this. Even the Gangaram group has shown uh, acceptable results with shunt uh, devascularization. Although albeit a bit inferior to what the shunt can achieve. But I would say that is probably a corollary of the kind of disease spectrum that when you have a patient who has extensive splanctic thrombosis, probably that's probably the only option that we can offer. Can and uh, please. In fact, uh, when the especially in pediatric age group, when the vein size is smaller diameter, so uh, though we had only experience of one patient, we did uh, try uh, side to side splenorenal shunt and it worked well. Did you use uh, prolonged anticoagulation because that's what Dr. Mitra used to advocate? We had used antiplatelets on that, not uh, so antiplatelet. Yeah. So how long has the follow-up? Actually, uh, two years he was uh, on our follow-up. After that, we lost his follow-up. Yeah, because bismuth has uh, recorded uh, four millimeters as the smallest size with interrupted suture technique uh, because the shunt grows with age. That's one thing. And the other uh, lens through which you should look at uh, the success of a particular surgical technique is when you divide the uh, manifestation of portal hypertension cases into three phases, like what you do in acute bleeding situations, what should you do in primary prophylaxis, whether shunt or surgery has a role in that, and secondary prophylaxis. Most of the overwhelming evidence that we have today is all in the phase, the realm of secondary Second. prophylaxis. Uh, acute, what has been your experience and what has been the experience in the, uh, the gathering here? Uh, acute, uh, uh, in fact, uh, very little nowadays. Uh, one case, I've, in fact, the case which we had shown about retroartic renal vein, that was a case uh, in acute setting. And uh, that was the uh, time, you know, that we had to choose uh, shunt over devascularization because that patient had portal biliopathy, PAG, and every known complication of it. So SB tube is very, was very effective in that acute setting. Uh, 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 I don't know, but in my uh, observation, SB tube usage has been decreasing uh, significantly. But in acute s setting where endoscopic and medical therapy fails, SB tube is a very good uh, method of tiding over that uh, period and converting that emergent into an urgent surgery so that you can prepare that patient very well for a... Uh, even Our experience even also says that if you can tide over the emergency, maybe with uh, SB tube or endoscopic sclerotherapy, or even now when people have used expandable stents to stop the bleeding, you can actually at a later date on a semi-elective basis do a better shot. Mm -hmm. And maybe that has good results. In the EHO, we have had good emergency uh, results with the mortality hovering less than 4%, but non serotic portal fibrosis we have had higher mortality in the emergency situation. That's a point well taken and uh, for primary prophylaxis, I know it's a controversial field, we have written about it, but uh, not many people agree to what we have done, but uh, any exposure or any in, a, in, uh, in our residency comments. days, uh, uh, we had patients where uh, EHPVO patient with a uh, splenomegaly uh, used to, uh, you know, put for uh, shunt surgery directly, uh, but uh, I, I, uh, in today's era, I am not so very, uh, yeah. 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 As I said, the numbers are now decreasing because patients are coming early and treated by endoscopy, but we don't see those large spleens with 
non bleed or something with uh, portal hypertension in fact sir uh, recently there has been a, 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 a study on uh, the role of beta blockers in ehpv also and it's, it has shown its efficacy also so do you think that may be most the reason people, that nahi most people have used it and this was documented that, long time but back but the evidence was not there that time yeah. so do you think that may be the reason that uh, i don't know i don't know but the thing is that uh, for portal bilirubin also when that may be an indication for the so called prophylactic shunt it is not always that you are successful with a shunt itself it is not likely to uh, remove the strictures uh, uh, or the the uh, narrowings in the cbd because they they in men, uh, around i think about i would say 40% of them they can be ischemic in nature and yeah, in that situation it's yes. not going to help your portal bilirubin but it might make it easy for your subsequent surgery so That's portal bilirubin does not help in those 30 40% percent patients in terms of treatment for bilirubin but it makes a treatment easier by yeah. making Maybe. it amenable for hj yeah. Maybe. Maybe. any further questions from the house using collateral as a no i haven't personally uh, any experience on uh, unconventional shunting but uh, this is what i thought to uh, present here to complete the topic then will a psrs help already there are multiple collaterals that to large collaterals so you are doing it for uh, indicate for the portal biliopathy for portal biliopathy we haven't studied in that fashion but uh, our dictum is that if the patient with portal biliopathy presents with obstructive jaundice or biliary calculi very very often which are associated with it that has to be tackled first by endoscopic yeah, means yeah. and uh, if after the endoscopic means you feel that it's not going to get resolved then you add a shunt and later on give a trial of removal of the stent and see whether the biliary dilatation subsides if that doesn't work then you have to convert to a surgical hepatocogenostomy at a later date so, so it's a stage about the uh, need for surgery when the, there is already large we can't comment on that but yeah. because as uh, i can draw the experience from uh, bleeding uh, purposes when there was uh, variceal bleeding and despite the fact that there was uh, existing natural yes. shunt we used to still go ahead and do a shunt okay. and that would take care of the bleeding so i don't think these natural shunts are good enough to decompress the system properly okay thank you sir. that's our impression renal vein size diameter minimum how much required for doing a psrs for renal vein there is no minimal size criteria but for splenic vein yes. it is said that uh, it less than 4 mm veins because the flow is also compromised may not be good enough to have a sustained uh, patent shunt in a subsequent stage and about sir uh, uh, giving anti platelet after uh, is it required so personal choice we haven't been using yes it can be done about ehpv with portal biliopathy so we have published uh, uh, three cases uh, where we have done a shunt along with segment 3 hepatic jejunostomy the experience is that uh, because of the availability of an endoscopy uh, more and more patients are coming at the later age for the shunt surgery yes. so those patient develop a left lateral segment atrophy because of some reason and segment 3 is very easily approachable on the surface of the liver so out of uh, 21 shunt surgeries in three cases we have done shunt along with the segment 3 hepatic jejunostomy with an expectation that if the portal bilirubin does not uh, uh, regress even if in that situation that patient doesn't require second stage surgery we have published this in the Uh, I guess it's got a acceptable alternative we have also done it in a few but long term results are not known Anything else uh, Sandeep you want to say sir you want to 